Okay, good morning everybody. Welcome to Southridge. Uh, so great to see you this morning. Glad uh, it's a beautiful day here outside. And uh, so glad you can join us here outside or inside. Or if you're watching uh, online at home, um, welcome. And thanks so much for joining us. Okay, we're going to start the service um, by singing some songs together. And the uh, first song is called Be Still. And uh, the second song is The Blessing. And if you've been around Southridge uh, over the last couple months, or you've been tuning in, uh, these are songs we've been singing. Um, however, if you are interested in uh, checking out the words, they're really powerful, powerful words to these songs. You can find them at southridgecc.org slash songs. So you can check out the song lyrics if that's something you'd like to do at southridgecc.org slash songs. All right, let's sing Be Still. is faith and grace of life. I won't be afraid. You are here. You silence all peace and kindness will follow me, will follow me. Surely love and mercy, your peace and kindness will follow
Yeah. 
you, Father. Um, just thank you so much for this beautiful day uh, that we can join together and, um, and meet and, um, and sing praises to you and, and learn about you and learn about your word uh, and just join together in song to praise you. Um, God, we thank you for these songs this morning. Uh, we thank you for this song, the blessing that, um, that just reminds us of your love for us uh, and that you're with us and you walk through difficult times and hard times and you're right with us Lord and that you're for us and we're so thankful for these things so thank you God again this morning for this time of singing uh, and for this service together in Jesus name we pray hello good morning and thank you worship team for leading us in worship this morning my name is Julia Arthur, and I am an SR Students Leader here at Southridge, and I'm excited to be able to share opportunities with you this morning. Each week, we highlight a few things that we have going on that offer you an opportunity to connect and grow together. As I go through them, know that you can go on the church's website and click Current Opportunities to learn more details about any of them. Southridge is super passionate about helping couples for marriages that not only survive, but thrive. So next month, there's a great opportunity to invest in your marriage by attending Marriage Night virtually. It's a right now media event that will be simulcast into homes on September 12th. Marriage Night will feature well-known marriage speakers, Les and Leslie Parrott, Matt and Lauren Chandler, as well as the hilarious com comedy sorry, of Michael Jr. Why not set aside the night as a date night for you and your spouse or your fiance to watch and discuss? Registration is open now, is easy, and it's affordable. One of the things that God has really revealed in this time of the pandemic is how much we really need each other and community. One of the phrases that we often see throughout the Bible is one another. It is very clear that we simply cannot fulfill God's vision for growth in our lives and our faith alone. We need each other and we need community. SR Groups is an awesome opportunity to be able to form friendships with one another, to root yourself deeper in the word of God, as well as get equipped to redemptively impact the community around you. This fall, SR Groups will be available both on and off campus as well as virtually. Sign-ups for SR Groups will be available beginning next Sunday online. We'd love to have you sign up as well as bring those you know to sign up as well. Baptism is a very important milestone in anyone's spiritual journey. But what is baptism and why is it important? These are some questions that we will be addressing in understanding baptism. So whether you are curious about baptism, want to know more about Southridge's convictions, or are interested in getting baptized, understanding baptism is an awesome opportunity for you. The next session will be September 13th on the church's patio outside. Again, you can click on Current Opportunities on the church's homepage to learn more details or sign up about any of the things that I discussed this morning. Thank you so much for your time, and now I'm going to hand it back to the worship team. All right. So the next song we're going to be doing is uh, it's called Psalm 23. So what we've been uh, studying and learning about all these weeks. Um, and this is just a beautiful song. Um, it's... I think the first time I think that we've done it here, and so if it's new to you um, and you just want to listen and let it, you know, wash over you, that's great. Um, if you know the songs and you want to join in, if you know the lyrics and you want to join in, that's fine as well. But um, just uh, let's just enjoy this song and um, let the Holy Spirit speak to us as uh, as we go through Psalm 23 together. Thank you. 
the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In green pasture, he makes me lie down. He restores my soul and leads me on for his name, for his great name. Surely goodness, surely mercy is right beside me all my days. And I will dwell in your house forever and bless your The terror of night is at my door. I'll trust you, Lord. Surely goodness, surely mercy is right beside me. Good morning. I, uh, I don't know if you've listened to the last couple songs, but um, I basically indoctrinated myself, saturated myself with these three songs the last week. And I still honestly cannot even sing them or hear them without being moved to tears. I don't know if you, if you heard those two songs, they're both based on Psalm 23. And the undercurrent of each one of them is surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. And that's our message today. Surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of our life. And I, I can tell you, I don't think that there's a message that we don't need to hear today in America, in this world today, more than that. That surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. 
Mike and Donna just sang that so beautifully, and I just can't imagine what their house is like to be able to hear music like, like that in their house, right? But how powerful to hear song, and it's so strange for me to be here today, and people can't sing, or people don't want to sing, or whatever. So I would encourage you, we're going to finish at the end with the blessing. I would encourage you to sing if you feel so led to sing and look in another direction from somebody, but there's nothing more powerful than the message in music. It's way more powerful than what somebody has to say. God speaks powerfully through music. And, you know, we've been talking about the Psalms, and the Psalms are the hymnal of the Israelite people. The Psalms are songs and poems that were written thousands of years ago and sung by multiple people. We've concentrated now on Psalm 23. I'm not a grandfather yet, though my daughter, who was just up here, just got engaged. So let's give her a hand. There we go. There's the man of her dreams. One day, hopefully, I'll have a, a grandchild. But your grandparents always would tell you, you know, you need, to, you need to live life to learn what life is about. And I know that, that David wrote Psalm 23, and he wrote Psalm 23 from experience. David had lived through a lot. David had had Saul try to kill him. David had been a shepherd in the fields. David had been a warrior. David had been chased down. And yet David could look back in his life, and he went through the valley of the shadow of death. He looked back in his life, and he said, Surely goodness and mercy have followed me all the days of my life. My name is Dan Arthur, and, and my family and I, we've been here for 22 years. I, I serve on the board. I'm just happy to be a part of, of, of today. Just want to greet everyone that's here outside. It's a great, beautiful day. Greet everyone that's watching online and greet those that are watching in the auditorium. And before we start, if we can just open in prayer. God, I just thank you so much that you are real, that you are good, that you're alive. God, we thank you for the power of your word. God, we just pray right now that the words that are spoken this morning will not be my words. God, it will be your spirit speaking through me. God, we just prepare, pray that you prepare each one of our hearts for what you have to share with us today. In your name, amen. <clears throat> you know, if, if, uh, if we remember we started Psalm 23. Nathan, if you remember, started with the five fingers, right? The Lord is my shepherd. And honestly, the only question that matters to all of us, the only question that matters to each person here is, is the Lord your shepherd? Do you know the God of the universe as your shepherd? If you don't, there's nothing more important for you to do today than to come into a relationship with that shepherd. If you are someone that is a follower of Jesus, are you looking to God, Jesus, to be your shepherd? The verse today is, is, is Psalm chapter 23, verse 6, and John Ciotta challenged us a couple weeks ago about memorizing scripture, right? So the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in a path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Then our verse today. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to copy Nathan and do the five fingers, and I want to reverse a little bit some of the sections of that, of that verse. I'm doing chapter 23, verse 6a. Surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of my life. So it's surely all the days of my life, goodness and mercy shall follow you. First, surely. So if you come over our house, and we, well, my wife and I love to entertain. It's been tough to entertain the last five months. But if you come to our house and you come to dinner, be prepared because we always like to ask questions. And so we want to have, we want to learn from each other. We want to engage with each other. And we often put questions under the plate that you have to answer. So one of our favorite questions going back in time was, and it's a good question for a discussion starter for you later, is are you a glass half empty person? Are you a glass half full person? And I think we all understand that like psychologically, or however you say that, there's a certain way that each one of us is wired, that we're wired more to be glass half full or more to be glass half empty. But the reality is if I understand what it means to know Jesus, right? 
If I've accepted Jesus and I'm a follower of Jesus, the Bible says that the Spirit of God now lives inside of me. And he says that spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is inside of me. And if that's the Spirit of God that's living inside of me, then I'm, a pretty, I'm not just a glass half full person, I'm a glass overflowing person. So I love that David starts this section, that really the crescendo of Psalm 23, by saying, he doesn't say possibly, he doesn't say like maybe, he doesn't say like I, I, I kind of hope this is the truth, he says surely. He says, I'm telling you, whatever I'm going to say after this, you need to know surely this is what's going to happen. Who is David? Like we know David as a warrior and as a king, but we forget that David at one time was a boy, a shepherd boy, and he talked about beating off a lion and beating off a bear. And one day his dad said, go and meet your brothers, because that's what they did in those days. In the springtime, they had war. So they went to meet his brothers and to bring him some food. And he got there, and all of a sudden, there's this big Philistine in the valley challenging the armies of God. Who's going to come fight me? And everyone was afraid. And here was this young little boy, David, with the confidence that only comes from the Spirit of God, saying, who is this man? to challenge the armies of the living God. I don't need your weapons. I don't need your protection. I'm going to go fight him with the spirit of God. David was someone that was confident in who God had made him to be. And we, as followers of Jesus, are called to be confident. It says in Hebrews chapter 4, 16, that we can boldly approach the throne of God because of what Jesus has done for me. Are you confident in who you are? Are you sure of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 says, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. My question to you is, do you know? Are you sure that you have eternal life? Can you say that you know that I'm going to spend eternity with God in heaven? We can have that assurance. 1 John 5 says we can have that assurance, and David was sure of who God was, and he was sure of what he was going to tell the people right now. Surely, all the days of my life, all the days of my life. I love that we're having an opportunity for uh, marriage, for pre-marriage, for people that are married. There's nothing more important in life. The most important relationship we have is the relationship we have with, between husband and wife. And one of the best things that my wife and I do, we do pre-marriage mentoring. It's been the greatest thing for our marriage to keep us in line. And one of the things we talk about is the, the concept of contract versus covenant. And I will tell you that, you know, I've, I've performed a lot of wedding ceremonies. I always encourage them to write their own vows, but we also do the traditional I do vow, where we ask a question. And I will tell you that virtually every single person that's ever answered that question in their marriage has no idea what it actually says. Do you, Dan, solemnly agree before these witnesses to have Dawn to be your lawful wedded wife, to love and respect her, honor and cherish her in health and in sickness, in prosperity and adversity, and leaving all others to keep yourself only unto her so long as you both shall live? Whether things are good, whether things are bad, whether I'm rich, whether I'm poor, whether I have Alzheimer's, whether I'm healthy, whatever the situation I'm in, the, the decision that we made as a husband and wife is I'm in it no matter what. And really the, the message of the Bible is like God compares the relationship with God and his people with a marriage relationship, right? Most of us enter relationships like a contract. Like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sign to this. I'm going to agree to do this if you would agree to do that. But if you, if you, if you fall flat on your agreement, then I'm going to back off as well. God doesn't sign a contract with us. God's covenant and commitment with you is that he loves you desperately, that his commitment for you is forever. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God will never leave you nor forsake you. God will never leave you nor forsake you. I am sure that all the days of your life, the God of the universe loves you desperately. His commitment, his covenant is to you. You know, my wife and I, I've, I've talked about this before the last five months. One of the, there's a lot of great things about this pandemic, one of which, and re, pardon me if I've said this before and I repeat myself, but that's because I'm getting older. But um, my wife, since we've been married 35 years, has always wanted to walk. Let's walk. We had a dog. Let's walk with the dog. Let's do this. Let's walk. And I never, 
I don't know, I maybe walked like three or four times in 35 years with my wife. And now, in the last five months, there's probably been like three days that we haven't walked at least six to ten miles every single night. And we live uh, in, in Lebanon, we live down off 31 behind Bunt Park, and, and like I've lived here 22 years, I had no idea how beautiful it is. Like we walked along, if you know any of that area, walk along River Road, and there's horses, and there's donkeys, and there's llamas, and there's coyotes, and there's people fishing, and you, we have a mountain, and you go over a mountain, beautiful homes, and all that kind of stuff. And also, there's sheep. You walk on River Road, and there's a, there's a house, ridiculous houses, like way up on the, on the top of the hill, and the, the grass goes all the way down to the road, and then across the road, there's a pen for the sheep, and then there's the river. So my wife and I would walk by, and obviously reading Psalm 23, all of a sudden, wow, there's the sheep. That's great. And so watching the sheep, and these sheep are like in, these, in the pen, and they're kind of controlled, and they're pretty much by themselves. And one day, like two weeks ago, um, we saw the pen being opened, and there was a, a man and a woman there. So me being just very, you know, I can't stop talking. I said, who's the shepherd? So she right away pointed to him, and he said, yeah, I'm, I'm the shepherd, and, uh, which is pretty cool to see. And so all they were doing was taking the sheep from the one side of the road to the other. And I could tell that it was a, it was a process to figure out, I don't know, it's like 30 sheep, how to get the sheep from here to there. And it's, there's nobody on the road, there's no traffic, a couple bikes, a couple people walking. But it was difficult for them to get the sheep together and walk across the road. A lot of the commentators, when they, when they see this section, they talk about the fact that the sheep that we're talking about are not sheep like on River Road in a pen. These are sheep that are being led by a shepherd in the wilderness, on the mountains, in the hills. And it wasn't just the shepherd. While the shepherd was there to help them, they also had sheepdogs, right? And the sheepdogs would be alongside of the sheep, and they would keep when a sheep went astray, the sheepdog would bring them back together. So commentators always talk about the fact that the sheepdogs are goodness and mercy. The sheepdogs of goodness and mercy are there their whole life to, care, to keep the sheep in line. So surely, all the days of my life, goodness. What is goodness? I think when we read this verse, like I, I spent probably more than half my life at a camp in New Hampshire called Camp Berea. Starting when I was like eight years old until about 12 years ago. And... Uh, one to two weeks or a whole summer up in New Hampshire at a camp. And the most challenging thing about a camp is to get two to 300 kids up at 7 in the morning and get them into the dining hall. So to get them into the dining hall, you get them there, and we'd often start the day by singing a song. Heavenly sunshine. This is the day that the Lord has made. We also sang a lot, Psalm 23, verse 6. If you're over the age of 40 and you went to church your whole life, you know this song. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. All right, there we go. I put myself out there with that one. But I, I grew up knowing that song my whole life, and a lot of you that are, you know, whatever we want to call older, whatever, I could see you singing the words, right, because you know the song. And I will tell you that I knew that song my whole life. I never knew what it meant. I never really knew what it meant that surely goodness and mercy follows me all the days of my life. What is goodness? I think when, when we first see that verse, we all think, if I follow Jesus, only good things are going to happen. I'm going to be blessed. I'm going to be wealthy. I'm not going to get sick. Whoever gets sick in my family is going to get better. Only good things are going to happen. I mean, God, despite what some people may say, never says that. Never says that. We quote Jeremiah 29, 11, right? I know the plans that I have for you, right? And God was speaking to people that were in Israelites or living in Assyria, and so he wasn't promising them they're going to be wealthy and rich. He was promising them that he had a plan for them to use them in a powerful way. And goodness is really receiving things that you do not deserve. And I'll say this. I'm going to say three things about goodness. The first is this. The goodness of God is independent of your situation. 
The goodness of God is independent of your situation. We sing songs all the time about God being good. He's a good, good father. If we're honest, when things are good in our own lives, it's so easy to say God is good. It's easy to sing God is good. But the goodness of God has nothing to do with your situation. Do we grab that? The goodness of God has nothing to do with your situation. You could have Alzheimer's. You could just be losing your wife. Something tragic could have happened. That has nothing to do with the fact that God is good. The goodness of God is totally independent of your situation. I would say that that's a challenge for us to understand because most of us really want God to give us really good things. And when God does give us really good things, we're pretty happy with God. But God is good no matter what. What are the good things that God gives us? I think Psalm 103 is really the most powerful uh, chapter in the Bible that tells us what are the good things that God gives us. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all your sins. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. He satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. The goodness of God is independent of your situation. The second thing I want to say is this. The goodness of God is the foundation of our faith. The goodness of God is the foundation of our faith. We stand on the fact that God is good. It's a challenge for all of us. Like I have family members, right, that question God's goodness. We all know a lot of people that say, well, like I see the hypocrisy of people. If God is good, why do bad things happen? If God is good, why did Greta Miners pass away last week? I mean, why do those things happen? If God is really good, then why do bad things happen? And I will tell you, if you don't believe that God is good, you have no foundation to live life. You have no foundation to handle whatever comes your way because I guarantee difficult things are going to happen. Hard things are going to happen. And if I don't believe that God is good, then I have no hope. I mean, God created the world in the beginning, and he said it, it is good, and everything that exists in the world today is good because God created it. We have to believe that. We have to know that. The goodness of God is the foundation that I stand on. I can't sleep at night if I don't believe that God is good. I can't handle adversity if I don't believe that God is good. Jeremy spoke a couple weeks ago and referenced the book, The Insanity of God. So we all, quite often, as a family, we watch Sunday morning together. Um, we have a family beach house. We're all watching it. And he mentions the book, The Insanity of God. I look on the bookshelf. My mom has a book, The Insanity of God, on the bookshelf. Um, I think my dad got it years ago. It's just been sitting there and never been read. I took that book off the bookshelf after Jeremy spoke. I didn't put it down until I was done. I would encourage you to read that book. It's an incredibly powerful book about a man who went all over the world and he interviewed people that were persecuted Christians, people in Russia, people in Ukraine, people in Africa, people in China, and asked them, like, why are you doing what you do? Why do you live life the way you do? They don't, they don't receive the good things that we often have here. Our perspective of Christianity is often, if we're honest, Americanized. So what, why are you following Jesus and willing to give up everything? And here's what, here's what he said. All over the world, we encountered committed followers of Jesus who trust even his toughest teaching. They understand that anyone who wishes to save his life must first be willing to lose it. They're willing to take that risk because they believe that ultimately good has and will defeat evil. Love will finally overcome hate. And life will conquer death forever by the power of our resurrection faith. They know that the final chapter of the greatest story ever told has already been written. And they know that in the end and for all eternity, God 
will have his way. I love that. These people said, you know what, I'm willing to give up my wife, my children, my job, my house, my life. I'm willing to give up my life because I believe that good has and will defeat evil. That Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago, came down, died on the cross, and rose again. And at that moment in time, good defeated evil. And the battle is over. And we know that one day we're going to live eternally with him. And so I need to believe and I need to live my life motivated by the fact that God is good. One of the verses, that, again, that we quote a million times that we don't probably really understand is Romans 8, 28. God works together all things for good for those that love him. I think it's easy for us to use that verse like any verse in the wrong way. What God is, what, is, what does that mean? That means that no matter what happens, if I believe that God is a good God, that every situation that happens, God works it together for good. If we're honest, you may not see that now. You may not see that in your life. I guarantee that one day, if you know Jesus and we get into heaven, we will see what happened. We will see the goodness that happened. But God says, because he's a good God, whatever the situation that happens, he's going to work all things together for good. Do you believe that? The goodness of God is independent of our situation. The goodness of God is the foundation of our faith. And finally, have you experienced the goodness of God? Have you experienced the goodness of God? I grew up in Cranford, New Jersey, and uh, I had a guy named Jerry that I grew up with. And uh, Jerry and I played basketball together on the playgrounds in Westfield and Cranford for years, played in school together. Um, and then I, w I went away to college. I went away, went away to college. I remember I wrote Jerry a letter explaining my faith and explaining, like, just who Jesus was and what I really wanted him to believe. And, um, and then over time, I've seen him a couple times ever since then. At the same time, I grew up in a church, and there were two other guys I grew up with. One was, the guy's name was Mike. Mike ended up being a, uh, one of the pastors at Liquid. And Mike also played basketball at Westfield High, five o I mean, Westfield YMCA, 5 o'clock every morning, and he played with Jerry Paradiso. And he shared the good news of Jesus, Jesus with Jerry. I grew up with another guy named John, and John ended up being a teacher in Maplewood. And John ended up teaching with Jerry at Maplewood and had a, had a painting business in the summer, and they painted together in the summer. And while they were painting, John told G Jerry about Jesus. Late November last year, I got a call that Jerry was in a hospital in Manhattan, and he has cancer, and it, was, and it wasn't good. And I went to be with Jerry, and, I, and we read, I read Psalm 23 with Jerry. And we talked with Jerry about, about his faith, and he talked about me, Mike, and John, three disparate people that knew each other, but from different ways had talked to him about Jesus. We had a funeral in February because Jerry passed away, didn't make it. We had a funeral with four or 500 people before COVID, and we were able to talk about the good news of who Jesus was and celebrate Jerry's life. But Jerry Paradiso is in heaven because God is good. Now, a lot of us here, we, we talked last night at our table now, the question, like, what do we think about the goodness of God? And my wife said, you know, like, for us, like, I have, like, two, three generations before me that know Jesus. And so, like, I'm privileged to know that, right? And Dawn's family, the same thing, two or three generations that know Jesus. Like, that's not an accident because God is good that's happened. Some of you, maybe you're the first generation. Some of you even right now, maybe you're, you're listening or you're standing here and you don't know who Jesus is. And now's the time for you to accept him because God is good. And God's desire is, is that he wants you to know who he is. For those of that, that know Jesus, the other question is, are we good? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Like if I say that I am a follower of Jesus and I say that God is good and God lives inside of me, then I need to be good. That has to affect what I do when I get my gas. That has to affect what I do when I drive. That has to affect what I do when I do social media. That has to affect what I, how I talk to my wife. That has to affect how I talk to my children. That has an effect on every aspect of our life. If God is good and if I am good, I need to be someone that lives good. Have you experienced the goodness of God? 
Surely, all the days of my life, goodness and mercy will follow me. Mercy. Again, David was a guy that was a, God defined him as a man after his own heart, but David was a man that committed adultery, and David was a man that committed murder. And so David understood what it meant to be forgiven by God. He wrote a Psalm 51, in addition to Psalm 23, he wrote Psalm 51, which is incredibly powerful. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast your presence from me or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. All the days of his life, David could look back in his life and he saw the goodness of God and he saw the mercy of God. It says that God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose again and he forgave you of all your sins. But we need that forgiveness and that mercy every single day of our life. I love that David was able to look back on his life and to see that, you know what? It was the goodness and the mercy of God that's been following me all the days of my life. And it's the goodness and mercy that's following me right now. And it's the goodness and mercy that I know to, for the rest of my life I can live knowing that God will be good and God will be merciful and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Surely, all the days of my life, goodness and mercy finally shall follow me. There's a lot of different translations in the Bible. In fact, when I, when I recited Psalm 23, I think I mixed, I mixed and matched probably three different translations in how I said it. Right? So I learned this as, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Um, it actually, a lot of translations talk about, shall pursue me the rest of my life shall pursue me the rest of my life. God is a God who pursues you. Our favorite song for so many of us here is reckless love, right? That God will do whatever he takes. He'll break down walls. He'll climb down mountains. He'll do whatever it takes to reach you. God of the universe pursued Jerry. The God of the universe pursued me. The God of the universe pursues you. My favorite verse is, I mean, my favorite book in the Bible, talking to John Hingleberg about this, is Jonah. Right, the story of Jonah is really the story of us. That God has a plan for your life. And Jonah said, you know what? I don't like that plan. I'm going to go as far away as I can. And you know what happened? God sent a fish to grab Jonah and to bring him back. Because God pursued Jonah. The story of the prodigal son, again, an incredible story of some, one, like a lot of us here, maybe we go our own way. And yet God is there waiting for us. He can't wait to run and put his arms around us and love you and encourage you. God will pursue you the rest of your life. And he pursues you not as a God of judgment, but a God of goodness and a God of mercy. God wants to extend his hand of goodness upon you. God wants to extend his hand of mercy upon you. And I guarantee because God is a good God, he will do that every single day the rest of your life. I've asked the band, I know they're working their way up here to come back and we're going to sing the promise. And the promise really is a blessing. I think it's, to me, it's the song of the pandemic. It's the song that I think when we all were locked in, so many churches, included our church, sang this song together with people from all their houses together singing it. And I love that, I don't know if you know what the word amen means, but amen means may it be so, God. We're in agreement, God, right? The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turned his face towards you and grant you peace.
know who Jesus is, we invite you to, even now, to understand that he died for you on the cross and he loves you desperately and wants nothing more than to be a part of your life. My prayer is that you may know the goodness and the mercy of God. If you want somebody to pray with, there's a tent up here to pray with. If you're in the auditorium, there's something in the front. If you're online, you can click on chat. You know, the blessing is, is not just from Numbers chapter 6, but I think Psalm 23, 6, God's blessing you with his goodness and with his mercy. And God bless you with his goodness and his mercy every single day. My prayer is that, that you will grab hold to that, that you will understand and believe and trust that God is good. May God who is above you watch over you. May God who is beside you comfort you. May God who is beside you, behind you pick you up when you fall. May God who goes before you guide you in all that you think and you say and you do. God bless you all.